Hey everybody, it's Dr. Heidi again. Um, I am kind of stuck on the five lists. I did five mistakes we make when understanding the confusion. Um, I did five things we think are true, but they are not. And so for this episode, I'm continuing the, with the list of five. And I'm going to talk about five ways that we can protect ourselves. Now, um, as you know, toxic relationships make us give up our identity. It is not by choice. It is not your fault. It is a slow drip that we would never know was happening until all of a sudden we look in the mirror one day and we don't recognize ourselves. Uh, we don't understand ourselves. We may even say that we don't feel like ourselves. Um, the toxic personality, once we've invested in the relationship, really wants us to live their life you know, without any concern about the things we want in our life, the dreams we have, the ambitions we had in our life, you know, the things that we've aspired for our life, it doesn't really matter to the toxic person because a toxic person enters into a relationship for one thing and one thing only, and that is for you to help them provide security in themselves. Now, if they can make you believe that the way you are um, is not good enough or will not uh, fit into the relationship or is making the relationship rocky, um, we're really going to try to become something that doesn't have that blame attached to it. So we're going to be trying to become the person that they say will improve the relationship. And, and we're very willing to do that because our personalities are the supporters and the fixers. And if we can fix something to make things better for anybody else and us, we're going to do it. Now, if I, if I knew back then, meaning when I was in a toxic relationship, if I knew then what I know now, I would fight for myself. Um, what I went through is I went through years of being told that and believing, believing that I was not good enough, um, that I had some qualities that weren't going to work in a relationship. So if the toxic personality can convince you there's something wrong with you and that you need to change about yourself, um, I began the long spiral downward uh, into unacceptance and even self-hatred. And I say self-hatred, I hate using that term, but um, I've gone through a lot of things in my life where I felt like disappearing. Okay, to me, if I feel like disappearing, not meaning harming myself, just I'm never gonna be accepted. So if I just disappeared and the people that I know now didn't know where I was, I have a fresh start and maybe the new people would accept me. Now, obviously I've never done that, um, but but when I think about some of the things that I tried to change and then it still didn't help, you know, that feeling of, oh, can I just disappear for a second was kind of comforting. But, but why was it that I was so willing uh, to change who I was? Well, again, if I knew the things I know now, I would act different. But, you know, I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do in a partner type relationship. You know, we compromise. Uh, we give, we put the other person first. We cling to our new partner and we leave our old life. You know, this was my new life now and I chose it. Um, some of the negative ones are relationships are work or you made your bed, you need to lie in it or, you know, don't go back on your word. You made promises, you can't break them. And so, so me going up against the feelings of all of those commitments really made me go, okay, well, here I am. Uh, I guess I better fix it. And, you know, there's a term that I made up uh, I make up a lot of terms just because I think they're fun, I guess. Um, but there's a term that I made up that really summed up what I felt like when I had spent years in an unhealthy relationship. And um, I didn't understand it at all. But the term that I made up was toxic identity theft. And you guys have probably heard me um, say that. In fact, I think one of my podcast episodes is actually called uh, toxic identity theft. But you know, when I stepped into this relationship that wasn't healthy for me, I, I'm not sure that I had a total grasp on who I was anyway. Like I was young, I was still learning, I was still growing. I hadn't really figured out how I was supposed to adult yet, you know, but I probably still haven't completely figured that out. But because of that, I was easily convinced that there were things about me that that may be unacceptable or maybe incomplete, or maybe I just didn't understand well enough that the way I was, wasn't really going to work well in this committed relationship. Okay. Um, I did, however, know that before I stepped into this relationship, I was, I was very extroverted. 
I am social. I am fun. I am funny. I like to make people laugh. I like to be around people. I, I was not afraid of adventure. I wasn't scared of a whole lot. Um, I, I knew I was average, but hey, you know, my personality and me being fun and, and fun loving and, and like liking to be in the center of it kind of made up for the fact that I was average in sports and average in grades. That just didn't, that just didn't mean as much to me. But the longer I spent in this so-called committed relationship, I found that all of those things that I knew about me didn't really fit into this relationship very well. Um, I was too loud. I was too outgoing. I was too social. I was too happy. You know, how come you always have to be so happy? And I was too positive. You know, you don't have to make everything positive. What are you better than, better than everybody else that everything is so positive? So some of these things that, that I really felt like were good about me evidently wouldn't fit in this relationship. And the things about me like that were going to make this relationship unsuccessful, according to my partner, right? And, and I was, I was made sure that I understood this. And it was apparent to me through the criticisms, through belittling, through embarrassment, through disrespect, through punishment, you know, through um, name calling, you know, those were the things that, that were used against me to make me feel bad enough for the person I was to change it. Okay. Now these type of things that we hear are the things that make me the most sad when I work with clients in or coming out of or healing from toxic relationships, because these are the things we put in our little handbag and carry them off into the next part of our life. And I will promise you that 15 years later, I still have some of those things in my handbag. Now they don't always pop out, but every once in a while, here it comes. And I know that, that you guys listen to me and I know that you think, oh, Dr. Heidi's so strong and she's like totally healed and totally overcome. Well, there's days I'd like to think that, but there's days I am right where you are. And, and I guess that's good because you guys need to know we don't have to fix all this. We just, we just have to understand it and have strategies when things pop up. But through all of this, you know, belittling and name calling and criticisms, I started, I started believing the words. And so everything I knew about myself that I felt was good and positive seemed to disappear. And it, it disappeared because I wanted to be accepted in this relationship. I wanted to be good enough in this relationship. I didn't want to be blamed for the reason this relationship felt rocky. I didn't want to hear that it wasn't working because of me. When, when I had facts and I had evidence and I had the reality of, of what I observed that would have told me that it's not me. But when I'm told that over and over and over, and there's an excuse for all their bad behavior and it's blamed on you, if that's the only environment that you have that you're living in and you're trying to survive in it, you don't have a choice but try but to start adapting. So I gave up everything that that I stood for. I gave up my values and I, I accepted things I wouldn't have normally accepted. I put up with things that I wouldn't have normally put up with. I took the blame for things that were not my responsibility. I, I lived in a cloud of, boy, I hope I can make it through the day being a person that's not blamed for how bad this relationship is. I was asking permission as an adult. I was isolating myself from my friends, from my family, from my hobbies, because it was easier for me to quit things and cut people off than to have conflict all the time in the relationship that I had at home. I was overthinking everything. You know, you're not just, you're not just an overthinker when you're in a toxic relationship, the overthinking is being created by the fact that you have to survive. So you overthink things that a normal person in a healthy relationship wouldn't think twice about. I was, I was fearful. You know, I wasn't always fearful for my physical safety, but I was fear of upsetting them and not being good enough and having conflict with them. So there comes the walking on eggshells. I just want to be accepted. You know, I remember getting up in the morning thinking, okay, I'm going to do everything right today. And by 10 o'clock in the morning, that was completely out the window. So then you spend the rest of the day backtracking and trying to make up for this awful, awful mistake you made at 1030 in the morning when it probably wasn't even a mistake to begin with. But I was insecure. I was putting no time into myself. Um, I was lonely. You know, and I'm going to add to this too. I paid no attention to my life. I was home 
um, a week and a half ago for my dad's 80th. And my mom gets out a bunch of pictures of my kids when they were little. And she says, here, Heidi, I found these when I was cleaning out. Do you want these pictures? Well, I started looking at them. I don't even remember my kids when they were little. Okay. And I could feel that I was getting tears in my eyes when my mom handed me these pictures because I looked at them and I don't remember my kids when they were that age. So I was putting so much energy into keeping him happy and hoping this relationship was going to be better and hoping I could make it better. I didn't even enjoy the little things that you should be able to enjoy. Like funny things your kids say, how cute they are. You know, um, I don't really remember them being naughty because I don't remember anything. You know, and and when I think about how I was in that relationship, that was nothing like the person I was before I stepped into it. You know, looking back now, seeing the person before the relationship, seeing me in the relationship, and now seeing me out, I am completely a different person. Now, when I was in it, I really fought to get the person from the beginning back. Now that I'm out, I don't want either of them because that relationship made me so much stronger and I had to learn and I had to grow and I had to scratch and fight and to get myself back. And the relationships made me who I am today and your relationships are doing the same thing. And someday, you're not going to believe me now, but someday you are going to look back and you are going to know exactly why you went through this. Now, I put myself, I put my life, I put my security, I put my worth first. That's a priority. And, and I say I will never again allow that to happen and I will never again allow myself to be unprotected, but I do. I do. I, I fall, I fall down because sometimes um, I fall back into the cycle of trying to be accepted if I feel like I'm not. So what I have done is I have five things um, that I have made sure to keep track of every year, four or five times. I often review them so that I make sure that my relationship with myself is on track. Uh, I cannot have a relationship with anybody else unless I am true to the relationship that I have with myself. If my relationship with myself is faltering, my communication with my daughters is not as good. My communication and relationship with my husband is not as good. I may get snarky. I may detach from my friends. So I have these five things that I revisit a lot during the year to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do. Um, if you are in a toxic relationship, if you've removed yourself from a toxic relationship, if you're trying to heal and understand, I want you to really think about these things, no matter where you are in your journey. Okay. Now, some of these are going to be easier than others. And, and I encourage you to really keep track of what's easy and what's not. The first thing you need to do in order to protect yourself is you need to know who you are. Okay, write down what you know to be true. Write down what you remember about your true personality. I just listed a little bit ago. I knew I was extroverted. I knew I was social. I knew I had to have fun. Those kind of things. What is it that you know or knew about who you were before this relationship? And if you were raised in a toxic environment and now ended up in maybe a toxic marriage or a toxic friendship or something like that, start, start writing down the things that you know you're strong at the things that you're good at, the things you've enjoyed, because those are going to be the same things that kind of defined your personality. How did you, how did you interact with people? You know, how did others interact with you? What types of conflicts did you have with people who were these people and how did you resolve them? Because you're going to notice that there's certain people that are easy to resolve conflict with, and there's certain people that are more difficult. Write down the compliments that you've received. Write down what other people have said your strengths are. So at least you have a little bit to go off of, of who you are, because knowing who you are as a person, that's going to help protect you from toxic identity theft. Now, the second thing is to know your values. Okay. Everybody says that. What? Know your values. It's just like, love yourself more. Yeah. Know your values. What is, what is a value? Values are the roadmap of your life. They are each individual person's beliefs that guide you in your actions and your decisions throughout your life. You have a set of values that you believe in, that you hold yourself to so that you act in a way that you are proud of. Now, 
Um, I use them as a roadmap. If I have to make decisions, if I step into a relationship, all of everything in my life should be supported by my value system. So values are your roadmap to guide you in your beliefs, your standards, your morals, and your ethics. Now, when you are in the never ending cycle of unreachable acceptance, we begin changing our values because values in a way are boundaries, right? And in a toxic relationship, boundaries mean we have control. The toxic person doesn't allow us to have control. So anything that, that resembles a boundary or a value, they're going to criticize. So when we're in this un unending cycle of unacceptance, we start changing who we are to become what they need by clouding the borders of our values. We start allowing a little bit more, um, not worrying so much about keeping our values strict. And we began, we begin to change them so they accommodate a little bit more to what the toxic person believes. Um, because, because we're seeking acceptance and we're seeking to be good enough. So if we can just fit better into their value system, we will feel better um, about being in that relationship. You know, these are the things that we want people to see when they look at us, when they describe our character. These are the these are the things we want our kids to see when our kids look at us. These are the things we want people to say about us at our funeral after we're gone. You know, examples of values are loyalty, honesty, kindness, integrity, um, selflessness, compassion, honesty. Um, these are the unwritten rules which we live by. Now, toxic people not only will push back on our value system, they also often will insult our value system and they're going to pick on the values that you are strongest in. For an example, if you are a very loyal person, the toxic personality is gonna accuse you of being disloyal. If you are a very honest person, they're gonna accuse you of lying. You know, if, if you are very productive and you have a great work ethic, they're gonna tell you that you're lazy. Okay, so now if we think the way the toxic personality thinks, why would they do this? Why would they want to knock us down in the best attributes that we have? Okay. The reason that is, is they want us to feel unaccepted no matter where we are. And if they say we're a liar, if they say we're disloyal, and if they say we're lazy, what are we going to do? We're going to jump back on that treadmill to prove that we're loyal, to prove that we're not a liar, and to prove that we will work hard. And where is our attention the whole time? Well, it's on them because we're seeking their acceptance. We're no longer living for us and living for what we want and being self-accepting. Now our entire energy goes into them accepting us. And, and they know if we're working very hard on ourselves by trying to do what they say we need to do, they're pretty safe because your attention is going to stay on them all the time. And in that way, you don't have any leftover attention for yourself which means you're not going to secretly go get secure about yourself because you don't have any time to invest in yourself. Uh, when we give up our value system, we become very pliable. Now, I always held honesty as a value of mine. Now, I think it's probably because I can't lie. I can't even fib and people know this, but I always thought, you know, I hold honesty as my value system. Okay, for somebody who says she holds honesty as a value, then how come... My toxic person was able to lie to me and cheat on me and gaslight me and convince me that everything that mis he misbehaved over was my fault. Okay, someone who says that says that their honesty is their value system, yet the relationship that they're in is anything but honest. That's not me making my values apply to my life. And that's what I'm very, very cautious of now. I redo my values four times a year because I always want to stay on track with the different things in my life and my values being supported. Now, you can you can find um, ways to assess your values on the internet. In fact, I have um, a top value discovery uh, homework assignment in the Freedom Me online program that's available for purchase on my website. My entire program is in a written form. If you're in a place where you need to print it out, put it in a binder and hide it, um, there's the top value exercise in there. And that's the exact one I use. I have five of them printed out on my desk at all times in case I need them. If I have to make a decision, if I'm feeling insecure, if I'm feeling off balance, I get that exercise out to recenter me on what my beliefs are. You know, and I really started paying attention to this when you guys started listening to my podcast. Okay, people are seeking answers from me. 
I need to make sure that I am portraying the person I want to when people are listening to me. And so it's very important for me to uphold my value system. Values change as you grow and as you become stronger and you adopt them and you don't need them on a list anymore. You know, nobody needs to tell you that your family is valuable, but somebody might need to remind you that honesty is one of your values so that people in your life shouldn't be lying to you. So knowing your values and being able to stand up behind them and keeping them in every area of your life is going to protect you from toxic identity theft. Number three, know what you want in your life. This is a lot easier said than done, right? Uh, your attention has been on them and what they want in your life. And when somebody asks you what makes you happy, we say, I don't know. What's your favorite color? I don't know. They always wanted me to wear yellow. You know, well, do you have any goals? Not really. Where do you want to eat? Wherever you want to eat. Okay, we have to start learning what we want in our life. It's a hard question because we haven't been paying attention to that. And the easiest way for you to start thinking about this is just take out a piece of paper and give yourself 30 minutes and graffiti all over the paper, anything you've ever wanted, even if you think it's completely out of reach, because then at least you've got it on paper. Now, some of you might sit there for 30 minutes and have two things written on the paper, but when you put it out there, if you believe it or not, at least it's out there and it's something to think about. Um, I did this once, maybe seven years into my former marriage. I was at a seminar. They gave us 30 minutes to write everything down. And I thought, well, this is dumb, but I'm going to fall asleep because this is an insurance seminar. So I may as well participate. And I ended up writing three and a half pages of things that I would want in my life. But then when I went home, I folded it all up and I put it in um, the top of my jewelry box. I never, ever looked at it again until seven years later, when I was getting ready to leave that relationship and getting ready to relocate to a different place, I found it. I never ever read through that list again of what I wrote down that day that I wanted in my life. And I had over 60% of it. Now they say that, that a goal is just a dream until it's written down. And it was very eye opening to me. So I started doing that a lot, write down what you want, but then I started reviewing it because when I start, when I'm paying attention to it, it's a lot more prevalent in the front of my mind and it keeps my attention on it and I work for it. it then I start concentrating on that type of thing. So knowing what you want is going, to is going to protect you from toxic identity theft. Number four, know that you have permission to make a change. You know, over time, we become so intertwined with the toxic person and that's exactly what they want. We have a time investment. We have a money investment. You know, maybe there's children, there's commitments, there's promises. We are in, in these communities. We're in social circles. The, there's families involved. Now there's finances involved. We had these hopes and we had these traditions and, and we've got this vision of what we wanted. And when we think of making a change, we feel like we can't because there's so much invested. I remember feeling like I was in prison. I remember feeling like I was stuck, I was suffocating, and this is where I will spend the remainder of my days, right? Because when I thought about getting out and making a change, all of this stuff that was intertwined just seemed like way too big a mountain for me to cross. And I reached my half past quarter till I don't give a crap one day, and I literally changed everything. In one fell swoop, I disconnected from every single thing that once kept me intertwined. Now, you don't have to do it like that, but you do have to realize that when you feel stuck and you feel like you're in a prison, you still have the permission to leave a situation that's not healthy for you. Um, I know that it's easier to step into something that it's easier to stay in something that's familiar than to step into something you don't know. And when we think about all those things I just listed, it makes a really good excuse for us to stay. Um, I, I was in a prison and there wasn't even a door. I could have walked out at any time, but I did not feel like I could because I would weigh all of these intertwined things and it would just seem too overwhelming. So if you need permission to make a change, today I'm giving you permission to make a change. Um, now, if I start feeling stuck in any area, if I start feeling burned out in work, if I start feeling yucky in you know, just my day-to-day -day life, I know I need to change something. Now, for somebody who used to be scared of changing anything, um, I'm pretty addicted to change right now. And it's not that I don't have fear. It's, it's that I know if I don't change something, I have the fear of staying where I'm at. And that now to me is more fearful than overcoming and stepping into stuff I don't know. 
So knowing that you have permission to quit or knowing that you have permission to change something in your life is going to keep you protected from toxic identity theft. Number five, know what you don't want in your life. We don't have a ton of control over what comes into our lives, but we have a lot of control over the things that we remove from our lives. If we had a ton of, of control over the things that came into our life, we'd all be holding the winning lottery ticket, right? What we focus on is what we attract. And when I was in a toxic relationship, the only thing I focused on was the fighting and the chaos and how am I going to stay one step ahead? And I hope they're in a good mood and I hope there's no yelling and I hope they treat me okay today. And I hope, you know, it was all of that. All I did was focus on the things I didn't want. And all I did was attract more of them because that's the only thing I was thinking about. I didn't even think about what I wanted more of in my life. Uh, nothing ever came into my life because I never thought about it. All I ever thought about was the stuff I didn't want in my life. Now, I focus on the things I want. I keep my attention on the things that I want to attract to me. And I don't focus on the things I don't want. Now, I'm not saying I do that perfect because there's days I get very overwhelmed. But make a list of the things you don't want in your life. Then identify what is the number one thing that's bringing this thing into my life that I don't want. So that you'll have a clearer picture on what you need to remove, get rid of, change, leave behind in order to be able to focus and think about the things you want in your life. Knowing what you don't want in your life and identifying what's bringing it into your life is, is going to protect you from toxic identity theft. Now, these are all, these five things are things I review periodically every year on a regular basis in order to make sure I am living the life that Dr. Heidi wants to live, to make sure that I'm making the decisions that are best for Dr. Heidi. And to remind me that the person that I knew and that I know myself to be does not get stolen or compromised by somebody else making me feel unaccepted or unworthy. So, so watch out because even though I'm not Dr. Heidi 100% of the time, like I would like to be, you know, I trip and fall and I, I get discouraged and, and I get down on myself, but, but for the most part, watch out because that loud, funny lady that talks too much. She's, she's back. And you know what? I really, really like her.